You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Was your dad killed, Remy? You know, there's a lot of controversy behind Just, you know, the story goes he was bitten by a dog. So then the second thing she did was she ran my background. And when she did a, a background check, she found out that I had two warrants out for my arrest. I had a warrant in New York and a warrant in New Jersey. I didn't know I had warrants. And at that point, I was petrified because I thought, oh, my God, like, my life is finally caught up with me. For me, it was like I, had, like, I had failed so much. I failed as a son. I failed as a brother. I failed in my record company. I failed in so many different aspects of life that I was tired of failing. And I decided that I'm not going to fail anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. It's either I die. I have to die before I fail. There's more people enslaved around the world today than any other time in human history. Today, there are more slaves. And you know, slavery has been around since the beginning of time. And there's more slaves today than any other time in human history. And again, that's, that's organ harvesting, that's sex trafficking, that's 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 labor, that's people being used for testing, that's people being used to move drugs in. It's a it's a it's a massive thing. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we got Remy Adeleke, is that correct? Yes, sir, Adeleke, you got it right, brother. <laughs> yeah, good man. First of all, I just want to say thanks for coming on the show, brother. Navy SEAL turned actor, writer, that man of many talents. You've now got a degree, and now you're doing a celebrity MA, SES. Like, phenomenal story, brother. I've read, read up a lot and watched a couple of your podcasts. Like, it's good to have you on the show. Uh, it's good to be on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor and blessing. Thanks, uh, thanks for the invite. Before we get into everything, brother, I always go back to the start of my guests, where you grew up and how it all began. Yeah, so I was actually born in uh, Nigeria. I lived the uh, first five years of my life in Nigeria. I was born in, in, into wealth. My dad was a well-known Nigerian engineer, and uh, he engineered one of the first man-made islands in the world. It's now known as Banana Island, but it was known as Lagoon Development Project. And fast forward, because there's a lot more to the story, but the uh, Nigerian government pretty much stripped my dad of his most valuable asset, which was the island, and all of his wealth was wrapped up in it. And uh, and we went from rich to poor. And he died within that period of us going from rich to poor. He died within weeks. And uh, so my mother was American. She met my dad in, in New York City when he was on a business trip. And then they got married five months later. And then uh, my mom moved to Nigeria, specifically Lagos. And uh, so after my dad died, my mother permanently relocated us to New York City, specifically the Bronx. And so that was my, that was kind of how I, I jumped the pond, so to speak. I, it's interesting because I have a lot of half siblings. I have about four half siblings um, who uh, they about 16 years older than me. And uh, they went all went to boarding school in the UK. And after they finished boarding school, they went to university in the UK and they all stayed. So I have a number of siblings who actually who still live in London and, uh, and, uh, and, and do business in London and Nigeria. Um, and that would have probably been my path if my father didn't pass away because he was getting ready to send us to boarding school, uh, me and my brother in the UK before he passed away. Um, so I, how, almost, how old were you when they passed? I was five years old. I was five. And he was starting businesses in Nigeria? Yeah, 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 yeah. So he had a uh, he had car dealerships, an engineering firm. That was probably his most lucrative business. And an art gallery. So he had a point. He was an entrepreneur. And his, his goal was to essentially, he was educated. And my dad was actually educated in the UK as well. He went to the uh, University of London. He got his... Uh, uh, his, his bachelor's and master's in um, in architecture and engineering. And he actually was on the British Financial Planning Council back in like the 60s, 70s, I believe. And then he was uh, on the board of the World Trade Center. But after he had amassed all of his wealth and success in the West, then he went back to Nigeria and established his businesses there. And uh, and then, you know, years down the line, that's kind of when I came along. So, so yeah, a lot of his, his businesses were international. I mean, he was always traveling. We were always traveling with him as well when we were young. Paris, London, Germany, the U.S. So um, his businesses weren't just in Nigeria. They had, A lot of them were started 
outside of Nigeria, in the UK and in America. Was there a lot of corruption in Nigeria? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of corruption. A lot of it. I mean, even to this day, you know, there's still a lot of corruption in Nigeria. And, and that's what ultimately led to uh, uh, my father being stripped of everything was corruption. And, uh, and you know, and, and all his, his untimely death. So, um, yeah, it's sad. I went back to Nigeria to finish writing the end of my book. And, and it was just as soon as I got off the plane, you know, the customs officers were like, do you have a gift for me? How much money do you have if you want to come in? So it's like, you got to give them money. Then we got pulled over by the police and uh, they demanded that we gave them money in order to pass. And just, I mean, just, and you see the massive, I mean, there's wealth gaps in every country, even here in the United States, but it's just, it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's, ma it's, it's massive in Nigeria, the wealth gap and uh, the financial gap. So um, a lot of that is due to corruption. <laughs> What was the island they built? Was it Banana Island or something? Yeah, it was known as, uh, it was, so it's now called Banana Island. It was initially called the Lagoon Development Project. And it was, my dad developed it because he wanted to create like a Wall Street, a financial sector that wouldn't just serve Nigeria, but that would also serve the all of Africa. And so um, um, he, you know, he, he um, bought this swamp essentially, dredged the foreshore, high Dutch engineers and dredged the foreshore to create land. So as you know, Heathrow Airport is on a man-made island, I believe. And you have the Palm Islands and Dubai. My dad was one of the first people to do that, to to to, to dredge, to hire Dutch engineers to dredge a foreshore to create a man-made island. And uh um and so you know after the island had formed, he had then, you know, had all of these schematics in place because he was going to build uh buildings and he had signed deals with McDonald's, Marks and Spence. Uh, Disney, all of these different companies to do, to, to essentially allow Nigeria to be like a central financial hub for a lot of businesses to operate in Africa. And, uh, and yeah, so it was known as the Lagoon Development Project. But then after it was stripped from him, it was renamed to Banana Island. And now it's Banana Island. And uh, some of the most, some of the wealthiest Africans in the world live on Banana Island. Dan Gote, um, I think, uh, um, there's a lot of rap, famous rappers that have property, uh, Niger rappers that have properties in, in Nigeria. So it's, it, oh, excuse me, on Banana Island. So it's, it's a, it's a very well known place. Um, in fact, the guy who used to be my dad's security guard is now like, he, he's the custodian of the island. So he's in charge of the island. Was your dad killed, Remy? You know, there's a lot of controversy behind just, you know, the story goes, he was bitten by a dog. Uh, he went out, he was super stressed out because of what happened, went for a walk outside, bitten by a dog, contracted rabies, uh, went to the hospital in Nigeria, got medication, the medication, the, 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 uh, coroner report was that the medication, the wrong medication, um, went to go take a bath after taking the medication and never came out. So, I mean, they say a heart attack, but they also attribute it to the uh, medication that he was uh, uh, given. Yeah. So your life, you've started off in a good family, loving family, rich, everything that you could ask for. It's been took away at five years old. That What happens with your life then? It's still a kid, do you know what I mean? Can you remember much of it? Uh, just a little bit, you know, my, uh, my, my, uh, you know, we had a lot of pictures and stuff that always, you know, my mom showed me when we came to the States that always, you know, kind of refreshed my memory as to the life we lived, the parties that we went to, the school I went to, you know, and, and those sorts of things. So, um, you know, I do have a, a somewhat of those memories, but as far as when I came to the States, um, yeah, all those memories are fresh, like for I me, mean, because that's to me where my life really, really begun, began, you know, and, uh, uh, it was, it was, a very rough environment, you know, Bronx is, I don't know what's the equivalent, uh, in, in the, in the UK, your, your, you know, hoods, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I have a good friend in, in London, his name's Jason Devil. Um, and, uh, we talk often and he always tells me about the projects, the, the slums, I guess you call it, or projects that he grew up in, how rough they were. He equated them to, uh, uh, to the Bronx or Compton or South side of Chicago. But, you know, the area I grew up in was a very, very rough area. It was crime rate, a lot of drugs, um, uh, crackheads, 
um, gangs. Uh, the, the mafia was very prevalent when I was coming up. So uh, we had a lot of guys who uh, uh, I would see the mafia guys go into the uh, local stores to collect taxes uh, from the from the store owners. So it was, uh, yeah, it was a very, very rough, rough area, you know. Um, and but, you know, the cool thing is my mom did a great job of masking the reality of what had happened. She did a good job of uh, essentially, you know, trying to inside of our little apartment uh, paint this picture of, of, of success and, and that everything was all right. Even though on the outside, when we walked out of our doors, it was crazy. Yeah, how hard was it to adapt from the rich kid from Nigeria to then going to the Bronx? You know, I, you know, I tell people all the time that my mom did a great job masking the reality of what had happened. You know, she um, she kept our apartment pristine. She brought a lot of my dad's art. So our apartment was feel, filled with art that I had grown up around. Um, she, you know, worked multiple jobs to try and like give my brother and I this the best life she could in this small apartment in the Bronx. And so at a very young age as a boy, you know, five, I think at five, six, seven, you know, you don't really, your world is so small. I mean, the majority of the world is the house or apartment that you live in. And that in and of itself is big to you. So it didn't really affect me. That transition didn't affect me because I still had three meals a day. I had toys. I saw my dad's art. And I mean, as a matter of fact, I remember when my mother told my brother and I that I had, our dad had died. And she put my bro my brother on, on one side and me on the other side. And she said, look, your dad's gone and he's not coming back. And we were so young and didn't fully understand the concept of death. And I think a part of it, too, was my dad traveled so much that to us, it was like, oh, dad's just going on another trip because we didn't understand the concept of death. And so after she told us the news, we just said, looked at each other and went back to playing. And my mom didn't cry at all when she delivered the news. So I think to us, that signaled to us that everything was all right. Oh, mom's not crying. She's not falling apart. That must not mean a bad thing. So let's go back to, to doing what we do, uh, what we were doing. And so I said, all I have to say that, you know, my mom did a fantastic job of masking the reality of what had happened in order to shield us and protect us from breaking down or, you know, just, just, having a meltdown or having some type of psychological, negative psychological effect because of the death of our dad. And uh, it wasn't until I was about eight years old that I finally realized what was going on because I would see things, you know, I would go outside more and, and, and then, you know, my mom would let me go to the corner store by myself and I would see these drug dealers and see these crackheads and, and, uh, you know, I would see him go with my mom to the rental office and watch as she, you know, would beg for extra time to pay the rent and, you know, Watch as my mom would give my brother and I food and, and, uh, and then stand in the kitchen doorway and, and watch us eat because there wasn't enough food for herself. So as I began to pick up on these things as I got older, that's when it kicked in. And I was like, Oh my God, you know, the life that I used to have is not the life I have anymore. And I remember, I'll never forget this. I remember being in my bedroom and staring at a picture of my father and I was eight. And I just remember breaking down in tears. And I just remember, you know, my mom came in the room and she said, what's wrong? And I said, Ma, we don't have the life that we have anymore because dad's gone. He's dead and he's not coming back. And I wish that he was here so that we could have a better life. And I think that that's when it finally hit me. And uh, yeah, yeah, I was, I was eight years old at the time. Does that become a big moment in your life to then not try and toughen up, but try and survive basically because your mum clearly had it well had the pain well the heartache but for you to see that at a young age especially at eight you're still not you're, you're nowhere near fully grown so how much does that play a massive effect on your your life now i think that you know at the time the effect that it had just look back in, in retrospect it, it unconsciously propelled me to seek out a father like i didn't realize it but I was seeking out a father. I was seeking out a man to essentially fill that void and teach me how to become a man. And it was at that age, and then as I grew older, even more so until about 9, 10, 11, 12, that I really began to look to the streets as a father and, and hip-hop and hip-hop culture and to teach me how to be a man and teach me how to talk to women and teach me how to make money. And, and you know, I was heavily, heavily influenced by the streets and hip-hop culture. And, you know, that led to me down a pretty dark path from 
you know, I started out stealing from my mom and then that progressed to stealing from local stores and then that progressed to uh, stealing from jobs and then that progressed to selling drugs and that progressed to running high level scams. And that all came from not having a man to show me, hey, this is how you're supposed to live. I, I see and hear what you're hearing from this music and, and, and what you're seeing from the streets, but that's not a good path for you. I didn't have that. All I had was what I saw in the streets. And because that was all I had, that's what I sought to mimic. And uh, yeah, it led me down a really, really dark path. But it was a gradual thing. You know, just like I said, it started out small. Just, all right, don't have a dad. Who do I look to for a dad? Oh, look to the streets, listen to music. Oh, these guys are talking about stealing. These guys are talking about, hey, you got all the money, then girls are going to respect you and girls are going to like you. And if you punch somebody in the face who disrespects you, then, you know, you're going to earn everybody's respect. So go punch people in the face, go fight. Like all of those things had molded me into the, into the teenager that I eventually became came and it all came from the absence of a father how much influence does the rap game have back in the 90s like biggie tupac Nas? that because they still have influence now their music still listened every every day every month like they're, they're still getting millions and millions of views that like how hard like did you see the kids from the street then becoming successful that like, was that a massive influence then in the 90s as it, as it was Oh yeah, it was it was a massive influence thing. I mean, I think I mean even going to school and, and and just hearing how the kids spoke in my class and 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 walking not just not just in school but walking to school. I remember as a kid, you know, eleven years old, and I'll never forget this. I, I was I had, was getting ready to cross the street, and there were these two older gang members. They had to be like. They had to be like 16 and 17. And they had a, a kid who was probably about my age. And they were forcing the kid to beat up this, this other small kid. And they had jumped in and they were beating up the other small kid as well. And, and you could tell that by what they were saying and how they were acting, it all came from that hip hop. And he disrespected you. This is a little kid, a little kid getting beat up by another little kid and two teenage kids. And you could tell that a lot of that influence was this kid disrespect you. And when you gotta remember hip hop, the big thing in hip hop is don't let anybody disrespect you. Everybody has to respect you. And so that came from music that, you know, and I'm sure there were some other things tied to that beat down session but i think uh, you know a, a substantial influence came from the culture i mean hip-hop culture permeated the bronx i mean that's where hip-hop was birthed and so it wasn't just me there were other kids that were like i'm gonna go get this money so i'm gonna go sell drugs and kids in middle school selling drugs you know because it's like i gotta get this money because that's what you hear when you hear when you listen to music you know and the way i quote this is when you go to other suburbs and in, 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 in suburbs, you have like YMCA. Like I live in a very wealthy suburb now. So what do we have? We have flag football programs. We have like cheerleading programs. We have like the YMCA. We have like these the, where the military comes and, and, you know, gives talks. And so and we have engineering and all these, these, these technical schools and influences around. So what a lot of the kids want to fall into that. They want to do that. Why? Because that's what they see. That's what they hear every day. Even at my kids' elementary school, the stuff that the teachers do, the things that the teachers expose the kids do, they expose the kids to, it influences them. And it shows them, hey, the world is big. You could be an engineer. You could be a doctor. You could be a lawyer. You could be an architect. You could be an entrepreneur. And because they, they're they constantly seeing that and getting that, and then in return, getting that from their parents, my, me being an entrepreneur and an actor and a speaker and my wife being a doctor, like my kids are just through osmosis. They're just like, I can do that. I can do anything good versus in the Bronx in the 80s and even now in inner cities when all you hear constantly is sell drugs, sleep with multiple girls, be a player, shoot somebody if they talk, then that as that gets into your spirit and gets into your mind just naturally becomes a part of who you are. And uh, yeah, it had a, a huge influence back then and I think it still does now. Um, I've worked in inner cities and, uh, you know, I've, as, you know, I've volunteered my time and I go into school sometimes and 
it's just like, you know, nothing is new under the sun. You see these kids with their pants sagging and, 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 uh, and, and, uh, these rags, these colorful bandanas hanging out, which, you know, signify what gang they're in. And, you know, I went to this one school where this is it. This is the last shot for the kids. Essentially, if they fail out of the school, they're going to ju- they're going to jail. Because these are kids who have gotten in multiple trouble in school and or they have some type of like criminal offense and they so they can't be in a traditional school. So they get put into this like, I don't even know, like almost like a jail school is what they call it. And this is their last chance. And if they fail or if they hit somebody or they shoot or stab somebody, they go on they go to jail. And, you know, I remember speaking at this one school here in San Diego and just looking at the kids and being like, dude, I used to be you. Like like put away with that culture, put away with that mindset. Like you can be great. Like you can be somebody. You don't have to be a gangster or a thug or a hustler. There's so much more to you. Um, but you know, the environment they end is just so penetrating and so consistent that it's hard to, for them to break out of it. Yeah, it's tough because it's survival more than anything you watch or read. It will condition your mind to what you want to believe and think. So it's difficult if they're seeing people from the streets then becoming successful with the nice cars, the jewellery, the women. They think that's the life to lead, but realistically, it's a fucking fake life. It's bullshit. And your your dad was clearly an intelligent man, but when you were at school, did, did you suffer because you were took out of that environment? Like, did you not believe in yourself as much? No, I always believed, that's, I always believed in myself. I always believed that I was going to win. <laughs> I had I had too much confidence. You know, I had too much confidence. And, uh, uh, you know, especially when, when I saw what I was doing was working. When I saw when I was selling drugs, I was making money. I mean, by the time I was 19, I had built this massive, I was bringing in thousands of dollars a week. I bought a freaking brand new, you know, $52,000 car. I was like, I mean, I was, I was laundering my money through a record company that I had started. I had artists, matter of fact, I still have, I keep the CD on my desk. That's <laughs> <laughs> me, me right there at 19. <laughs> me right there at 19, right? And these are the guys, the, the artists that I had. And we had made this album. We was, you know, we were doing small little tours and, and we were, you know, we were, um, recording in a studio and all of that was that very expensive. But I was fun. I was, I was financing it through illegal money. I was taking illegal money and running it into a, a record company. And, uh, and, and because what I was doing was working and had been working, I, I was overly confident. I was just like, Hey, I'm yeah. gonna make this is that suit you wearing? The clothes, is that suits? What about it? it? That's, yeah, that's a suit, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where did so, you so, get that inspiration from? Because it's not really... Yeah, so, rap so, music. so, yeah, so, so, you know, that came from P. Diddy. Puff, well, they, we used to call him Puff Daddy back in the day. Yeah. P. Diddy, and so, you know, all of the owners, you know, P. Diddy would always wear suits. And there was a joke back in the day, he would wear shiny suits. He was a shiny suit man. And, uh, and so, like, I, I was the CEO of this production company. So I so I thought that when we did this photo shoot, I was like, all right, as a CEO, all executives, including myself, we're gonna do away with the baggy clothes and we're gonna put on suits. So, you know, kind of show that we we we're, we're real, you know, we're real street hustlers and, and uh, get people to take us a little bit more seriously. So yeah, that's not typically how I dress, but all of this uh three other guys in suits as well. And we did that to kind of establish who's who in the hierarchy, you know, the the rappers versus the executives. What sort of drugs were you selling back in the day? Was it crack? Uh, no, I was doing coke, weed. Would everybody have not been selling weed back then? Was it? Yeah, yeah, a lot of people were selling weed, you know, but I was doing weed, dope. You know, I was, you know, those were my go to. I wouldn't sell to so everybody. Was, so what would happen was everybody was selling in the city. So again, me think, being, a, being a, thinking outside the box. I would drive, I would drive or I would take a train before I got my car. I would take a train up to upstate New York, Poughkeepsie, New York, where all the universities were and where all the, you know, suburbs are and, you know, the white kids are. And I would go sell drugs out there because there was just too much competition in New York City. You know, there was too many, you know, there was just, you had drug dealers on every corner and then you had the drug wars against different drug dealers killing each other. So it was like for me, I was like, I'm not trying to fight no war. I'm trying to make money. And so I went upstate New York and that's what I would do. I had a good friend of mine, um, 
Ricardo, who I grew up with in the Bronx, and him and his family moved up to state New York to give him, to give him and his brothers a better life. And uh, so I, you know, I went up there in, in, in his area where he lived, and he gave me a place to stay. And both me, him, and another guy who's the other guy used to sell drugs with is still in prison to this day. Um, he got caught up, and he's in prison. He's been in prison for like the last seven, or eight years, you know. And uh, and and that was that could that should have been me. I should be there with him. Um, uh, but yeah, man. Um, yeah, it was yeah. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to upstate New York and do my thing and uh, come back down and replenish, go to Washington Heights uh, to the Dominicans and buy more drugs and then go back upstate New York and that's how I made my money. Did your mum ever find out what you were doing? No, nah, no, I was pretty good at what I did. I, but thinking back though, I know that she there was so much money coming in. I know that she suspected. I oh I think I always say that I think a part of her knew she just didn't want to believe it. And so <clears throat> she just kind of ignored it. But I, I could be wrong. I, I she could have not I I, I lean more towards she didn't know anything. <clears throat> yeah. My mom has always been a pretty moral person. And I think that if she would have known, she would have she would have really gotten my ass about it. Yeah. So how does a kid making money, making thousands a week selling drugs, got his own record label? to then join in the Navy SEALs? I was uh, 19, had reached my peak. This was December 2001. I had kind of transitioned from selling drugs to selling illegal phones, which made me way more money than selling drugs, called blow-up phones. At the time, drug dealers, cell phones had kind of just started, and drug dealers were, uh, they were trying to find a way to communicate without getting caught. And so I would essentially sell what we call blow up phones, which was phones that were created with uh, dead people's credit um, or uh, the credit of people in hospice and activate those phones. Those phones would stay on for 90 days. They would use them after 90 days. They'd get a new no a new phone number and a new phone. Um, and I would sell the phones for anywhere between 300 to um, $1,000, sometimes $1,500, depending on the model of the phone. And that came with the service and everything. And so that was, uh, that, that's where I made a lot of my money. You know, I made way more money doing that than selling drugs. And it was, it was less risky at the time because there weren't a lot of, the, the police didn't know how to track this thing and, and, and work it out. And so I say, I ought to say like in, uh, and when I was in December, I, uh, got involved in a deal with a drug dealer where I had sold him. It got to the point where he started doing what I was doing, but with my product. So I had access to the phones and the lines of credit. And so I sold him tons of phones. And instead of him distributing them to his people, he started selling them. So now he's making double what I was making, which I didn't care. Well, I sold him, I want to say like maybe a hundred phones. And um, they cut off within like two weeks. They were supposed to be on stay on for, for, uh, for 90 days. And uh, it turned into a bad situation. My life was threatened, threatened my life, threatened my mother's life uh, indirectly. And uh, and that was a wake up call for me. You know, I had money, so I gave him that money and I made a couple, a few hundred more bucks, gave him that money. And then that's when I decided, you know, I can't do this anymore. Um, you know, I always, when I was a kid, my mom would spank my brother and I. And I know nowadays people are against it and people have their theories as to what spanking can do to a kid, but I can tell you what it did for me was it showed me that there's always a consequence for an action. It showed me that if you keep down a specific path, you're going to get a proverbial spanking by life. And that proverbial spanking could be a bullet to the head, it could be a long prison sentence, or it could be you getting punched and punched in the face and beat half to death. Death. And so I'm grateful for my mom for spanking me because it really told me that it really taught me that there's a limit. To, to, to doing bad things. And at some point, the devil's going to come knocking on this door to get his reparations. And so when that happened with that drug dealer, that was a big spanking for me. That was a big, like, all right, you've gotten away with a lot for a long time and you have to stop or things are going to get even worse. And at the same time, on top of that, the feds started figuring out what me and other people were doing with the cell phones and there were a few people who I worked with got caught and got 
sentenced to, sent to federal prison, got prosecuted and sent to federal prison. So it was a combination of those two things where I was just like, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I can't do this anymore. And so fast forward, you know, that was just, that happened in December, um, January, I was really trying to push my record companies. I remember, you know, go, I had meetings at Def Jam about this album and, and other record companies. And I was really pushing, trying to get a label deal because they would do label deals where they wouldn't just sign an artist, but they would pay you and sign your, buy your type of entire company and allow you to still run it. And uh, that didn't work out. And I just sat home from January until June doing nothing. And then finally in June of 2002, is when I was laying in bed and I heard this voice speak to me and essentially say, you need to get out of here. And then I heard that voice as clear as day. And that voice said, you need to join the military. And I was just like, what? And joining the military was totally contrary to who I was because I hated the police. And I associated anybody in a uniform as the police, whether you were a firefighter, whether you were in the army, navy, whatever. And I had a great disdain for the government as well. And so I didn't want to do it. So I know that's why I say I know that that idea wasn't me. I remember making fun when I was in high school, they were these ROTC kids, which were the 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 kiss up kids is what we call them, because they would wear their, their these fake military uniforms and and uh uh you know do do high school in their military uniforms because these were all kids that plan on going into the military. And I just remember just seeing just making fun of me talking about how corny and cheesy and how much of a simp simp wasn't a word back then but how much of simps they were and uh so yeah it was totally contrary to who i was but i remember after hearing that voice and, and and fighting that idea i looked around my room and i just said to myself what else do you have to show for you have nothing to show for. You've been around for 19 years, going on 20. Your brother's in college. You've done all these illegal things. Your record company didn't work out. What else are you going to do? And so, you know, I, I, I said, yeah, screw it. You know, what else? What else do I have? And so, long story short, I went to the Navy. I went to, at first, I went to the Marine Corps recruiter's office. The recruiter wasn't there. And then I went into the Navy recruiter's office. And there was a recruiter there by the name of Tiana Reyes. And uh, first thing she did was she had me take a practice ASVAB test because I told her I wanted to be a SEAL. And she said, well, let's see if you can qualify to be a SEAL. And I took the practice ASVAB test and I passed it to get a Navy, but I didn't qualify to be a SEAL. So then the second thing she did was she ran my background. And when she did a, a background check, she found out that I had two warrants out for my arrest. I had a warrant in New York and a warrant in New Jersey. I didn't know I had warrants. And at that point, I was petrified because I thought, oh, my God, like my life is finally caught up with me. Like all like I, the guy, the people who got caught up and were sent to federal prison, I thought I, I thought that's what the warrants were for because I didn't know what the warrants were for. And uh, I got up and I got ready to run out of the office. And uh, she said, what do you know? I was like, I'm getting out of here. I'm not trying to go to jail today. She said, well, if you go out there, you know. No, there's nothing good out there for you. I was like, well, what do you want me to do? <laughs> and she said, do you have a suit? I said, no, why? And she said, do you have a, 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 some nice pants and a collar shirt? And I said, I said, yeah, I could find something. Because that, that suit and that picture I had actually borrowed from somebody. And, uh, and so she said, come back tomorrow. And I said, for what? She said, shut up and just come back tomorrow. She was from the Bronx. She had joined the Navy. And, and then after she did her time in the Navy, she came back as a recruiter. And I came back the next day and she was in her dress uniform. And she took me to both judges. She took me to the judge in New York and the judge in New Jersey. And uh, both those judges advocated. She advocated on my behalf in front of both of those judges and asked them to expunge my record. Both judges, you know, because the, the charges weren't like crazy affairs. It wasn't like murder or rape or anything like that. Um, the judges both, you know, expunged my record. And it was in part because 9-11 had taken place nine months later. And so they were of the mindset that if this guy's trying to turn his life around after an act of war, then we'll clear his record so he could join the Navy. And then she went a step further and she fudged the paperwork to sneak me into the Navy. And that's kind of, it all happened really fast. I mean, like I went to the, that, I had that thought, went to the recruiter, and two weeks later, I was in uh, I was in Chicago in in, uh, in Navy boot camp, <laughs> my head shaved and uniform, and uh, yeah, man. How was who do you think the voice was? Think it was I, a dad? I, yeah, I believe the, no, I believe it was the voice of God. You know, like I, you know, for a long period of time, I fluctuated between atheism and agnosticism. 
So at that time, I want to say it was God, but I, looking back in retrospect, I truly believe that it was God's guidance because, especially because when I look at how things transpired, because like I said, I heard the voice, I obeyed that voice. I went first, I, 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 I walked down the street, I grew up on, went in the Marine Corps recruiter's office first, which I left that part out of the story, sat in the Marine Corps recruiter's office for 15 minutes. And then no one showed up. There was coffee on the desk, but the person didn't come in to the office, must have been in the bathroom or something. I left, went in the Navy recruiter's office, and I meet the one Navy recruiter who's willing to take a risk on me. And I, and she died, you know, just to kind of jump ahead a little bit, she died two years later. And I, I spoke to her family um, uh, afterwards, like years after, years later, and they said that that's what she did. They said that, you know, her brother told me that's what he did for her when he got some charges, but that's what she did for him when he got some charges. She was in the Navy. She left, but she flew back home to the Bronx, took him to a friend at the Air Force recruiter and got him in the Air Force because she didn't want and then another thing her brother told me was she would and when she was a recruiter she would drive around co-op city in the neighborhoods that she grew up in and she would pull up to drug dealers and say come on man we grew up together i see where your life is going come with me like let's go join a military let's go get a better life you know i, I did there's, there's more out there to the world she would essentially she was like a robin hood she would go go get these dudes in the hood and like these put them in the military because she saw where their life was going and I say all I have to say, I heard that voice. I go to the Marine Corps recruiter. If he ran my background, he wouldn't have done that for me. And I know that for a fact because I get messages from kids all the time who heard me share my story on podcasts and, 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 uh, and other platforms. And they say, can you, like, how did you get into the Navy? Because I have, I have this misdemeanor or I have this, this, this thing on my record and, I, and I've been trying for years. I've written senators to write me a letter and I can't get in to the military. And what can you do? Can you help me out? And I'll tell them all the time, it's all about the recruiters. As a matter of fact, I have a cousin who I tried to get into the military because he had gotten a charge, charges in Atlanta and I flew him out to San Diego and no one would, no one would touch him because of his, his small record. No one will work with him. So I say all I have to say, I believe it was the voice of God that guided me, not just to the recruiter that day, but to that specific recruiter who would work with me to help get me in the military. You know? where, where do you think you would have been if you never met this woman? Because she she, she sounds phenomenal. That, let's people, the world need people like that to give people chances when they don't think they've got anywhere to go. Where do you think your life would have been? Like she's potentially saved your life. She saved my life 100. percent You know, she, you know, she said, you know, though people when we were at the judge, one of the things she said was, though people make mistakes, that doesn't mean that they don't have potential. Though people make mistakes, and that's so true. And uh, if she didn't do what she did, I for sure would either A be in prison <laughs> for sure. <laughs> because like I said, the guy Roderick Brown, who I used to run with and and, and sell drugs and do all this, he's still sitting in prison. And, his, and and the crazy thing is, he was in prison in in uh, in Pennsylvania, got released from prison, and then got put in prison in New Jersey because of charges that you know he you know he had to you know he he had warrants and uh, for you know doing the stuff that we were doing and uh, and he's still sitting in prison right now. So I know I, I would either be in prison or I'd be dead. A hundred percent. What was the training like for the Navy? Because as, as a black kid from the Bronx as well, I think even you says there's only 1% as well, or less than 1% who passed the training for Navy SEALs. That How hard was it then? Was there, was there more against you then to pass? Yeah. Yeah. So for, yeah, hundred percent. So for the Navy, um, the Navy was easy. Boot camp was easy. Let's just start there. Boot, Navy boot camp was like <laughs> egregiously easy. Uh, and that's what I remember forget because I remember my first time, first night in boot camp, all of the kids, there were so many kids where you hear these wailing and crying from these kids because it's the first time ever leaving home. And I'm sitting in my bunk just cracking up laughing, you know, because here I am, this kid from the hardest streets of the Bronx. I'm listening to these kids from all across America and they're crying, mommy, I want my mommy. And uh, so that was easy. But yeah, SEAL training was, to even get into SEAL training, it took me, I, I had to check into, I went to my first command, which was Naval Hospital Camp Pendleton. And uh, 
and I just I just put the pedal to the metal when it came to training. Um, I I didn't have a car, so I would run three miles to the pool, jump in the shallow end, try to figure out, and then run three miles back home, uh, back to the barracks. I got an ASVAP for Dummies book, which was an academic book to study the uh, study so that I can get, get this, the scores, the academic scores I needed to get in the SEAL training. And then I just started making up workouts. And, uh, you know, after six months, uh, I had qualified to go to SEAL training. I checked into my first command in January 2003, which was Naval Hospital Camp Pendleton. And I checked out in January 2004, going to SEAL training. And uh, the train just to get to that point was nuts. It was, it was like, it was like, I, like, I, I you know, sometimes I think, how did I do it? And, I, and the answer is just mental. I wanted it. And that's kind of how I am now when I want something. I will run through walls to get it. And so the training to get to SEAL training was extremely hard. And yeah, when I got to SEAL training, it was, I mean, it was, it was horrible. It was, it was, it was, it was the worst. It was the most physically and mentally challenging thing I've ever done in my life. What's the, what sort of training do you need to do for to become a Navy SEAL? I mean, it's everything. It buds, you're doing underwater swims, two mile time motion swims and freezing cold water. Um, you're, you're running miles, miles of soft sand with boots. Um, you're, 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 you're doing obstacle courses. You're getting tortured. Uh, you know, there's a week in, in, in SEAL training called Hell Week where they, it starts on Sunday night and ends on Friday night. Excuse me, ends on Friday morning. And you stay awake for the, for, for that time. And you only you get two hours of sleep on Wednesday and two hours of sleep on Thursday. But other than that, you're up. And it's just straight torture. They keep you cold and wet the entire time to the point where towards the end of, of Hell Week, you're hydrophobic. You're terrified of the water. Um, the worst part of SEAL training is the cold. They do this evolution called surf torture when they lay you down. And a lot of people don't realize this, that, but even though SEAL training is in uh, Southern California, the Pacific Ocean is freezing cold. The Atlantic Ocean is, is on, on the U.S. coast side is warm, especially when you get down to Florida. But on the on the on the West Coast, the the Pacific, because that comes down from Alaska, the Pacific that that current that water is freezing cold even in the summertime, and in the wintertime it's like ridiculously freezing cold. And they 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 lay you down in the Pacific and they just lay you there until people quit. And uh, you know my my lowest core temperature i hyped out numerous times we call it hyped out but i call it hypothermia uh, hypothermia numerous times and my lowest core temperature at one point was 88.7 degrees they pulled me out gave me a, 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 a stuck a thermometer in me and uh, my core temperature was 88.7 uh degrees fahrenheit which is not good you know i don't know what that's the equivalent to that is celsius but that's that's you know, and, 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 the, and, and, the, and the norm, the norm for the average human being is 97.1. That's the norm, you know, when it comes to your temperature. I was at 88.7. <laughs> and he's that's, just... <laughs> that's dead. Yeah, that's, that's dead. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that was, uh, that's another thing they do. They, have, they do everything. You do dives, you know, once you do first phase and you go to dive phase and dive phase, it's, uh, you know, you're learning open circuit, closed circuit diving. You have a week called pool week where you have to do all these dive tests where you, you know, you have to swim down to your dive tanks and on one breath and, and put on all your dive gear on the water. Then you got to do that blindfold. But then you have, you know, uh, then you have a uh, uh, buddy gear exchange where you got to take off all your buddies dive gear underwater, put it on, and you guys got to share the oxygen, um, the share the the, the 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 tubes to breathe. Um, then there's pool comp where they tie your hose in a knot, spin you around, pretty much destroy your tanks underwater, and, and they do it when you exhale. So you know, typically when you when, when you go underwater, we all inhale, <laughs> go underwater. What they do is they where they watch your your bubbles go out on your tanks, and as soon as your bubbles go out, which means you exhale the air, then they hit you, and they tie your holes in a knot, and you have to figure out how to keep yourself calm and not just untie the knot because that's the last thing, one of the last things you do, but fix your entire rig, your straps, your you turn your air on, all of these different things in a proper sequence. 
And if you do one thing out of sequence, you fail the whole thing. And you're doing that with no air, <laughs> you know, because you exhale all the air out of your lungs. Um, and then you get to third phase and you do survival and you do land warfare and uh, weapons training and you go out to San Clemente Island, which is where the island where no one can hear you scream. And it's just nonstop torture with, you know, and you, it, it's, it's, it's just, it sucks, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it sucks. And, and that that's why the attrition rate is what it is. I mean, the class that I graduated with started with 270 and only 29 of us graduated. And that's the way it is every class. You know, you know, they'll graduate 15 guys, 20 guys, 29 guys, 30 guys, you know, tw- you know, 20 guys. That's the way it is every class. You know, you get all of these guys who show up and you only get a few guys that make it through. Uh, how long's training for to become an EBC? So BUDS is six months, and after BUDS, you go to SQT, which is about four months. So after you graduate from BUDS, then you're you get the rating of a SEAL. So I'm not sure I how it works in, in uh, British military, but like in the Navy and uh, we have ratings. So if you're in, if you're, uh, if you're a corpsman and you're, that's a corpsman's a medic, you get the rating of an HM. Uh, if you're an OS, which is an operations specialist and your rating is, you know, really, that's your rating, OS. Um, IS, intelligence specialist, so all these different jobs. YN is like a, uh, YN is like an admin, admin person. That's a rating. So once you graduate from Bud, you get the rating of a SEAL, which is SO, special operator. And then after you, um, after you, after that, you go to, uh, um, SQT, which Sears involved in that, which Sears like search, evasion, rescue, and escape. Um, where, I mean, that's where they, you know, you get tortured even further, you know, they strip you and you get beaten, you get, you know, how to involve, when to give information or when not to, you get starved, you're in a cell that's miserable. And then you go to free fall school, static line jump school, um, um, and then all the other follow on training. That's about four months. And then after that, then you go to your SEAL team. How, what made you stick it? Was it the, f- the fact that you didn't want to fail? Or was, or was this your last opportunity in life? Like, what was the message that, was it. that you had? For me, for me, you know, I tell people all the time, in order, like, in anything in life, when you want to do something, you have to have a deep-rooted emotional reason as to why you want to do it. Because that deep-rooted emotional reason why is what's going to sustain you when things get rough. When the winds and the waves of life come, then that, that deep-rooted emotional reason why is going to act as an anchor. But if you don't have a deep rooted emotional reason as to why you want to do something, if you have a superficial reason, like I want to be a SEAL because I want girls to like me, or I want to be a, <laughs> I want to be an actor or whatever, because I want to be famous. Those are all superficial reasons. And if you have a superficial reason, as soon as things get tough, you're going to walk away. And what sustained me was I had a deep rooted emotional reason why. For me, it was like, I, like I had failed so much. I failed as a son. I failed as a brother. I failed in my record company. I failed in so many different aspects of life that I was tired of failing. And I decided that I'm not going to fail anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. It's either I die. I have to die before I fail. Like that. Like it's either death, I make it, or I fail. Like those are the only three options. And that was what carried me through. It's just like I have nothing left. This is all I have. There is no plan B. You know. Did you have to do training twice, or did you not do Hell Week twice? Yep, I did Hell Week twice. Went through all the Hell Week twice. <laughs> Crazy fucker, yeah. bro. Why? I wanted it. Yeah, I wanted it, man. It was, uh, that was horrible. <laughs> 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 you know, that's why I have a lot of the pain that I have in my body now is because I went through, <laughs> I went through all, every phase of SEAL training twice. You know, it's, uh, I'm one of a few people that's done that, you know, and uh, I don't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because obviously I'm a big fan of David Goggins as well, and I think he was two or three times that. That's that's mental toughness. That like people don't even make it through the first week. You've went back months and months to go back again for the second time. Was it a? Were you trying to prove yourself that you weren't a failure, or other people that what? I know we talk about the mindset, but what was that then to keep pushing you to then go back and go through more torture and pain? Did you feel alive then in that torture and pain? Yeah, I definitely felt a lot, and I felt that report. <laughs> you know, um, I just uh, I, and I credit it to my mother. You know, my mother, you know, as I shared earlier, she had a hard life. She went from being a very rich, wealthy woman to being poor. And you know, when you're when you reach the top, 
you can you, you can get complacent. You get could you get comfortable, you know, living this life where you have nannies and drivers and and cooks and all of these different things and uh and it's all taken from you. And she could have easily went down a different path. But instead, like I watched this woman work hard, like sacrifice, suffer to provide for my brother and I, you know? And I think having a person being able to see that every single day, see somebody who lives, breathes and eats grit and determination, that just becomes a part of your nature. Just like we talked about earlier, how hip hop and, and you know, influence and influence the kids and this, it just became a part of what they did and how they lived. My mother and the way she was and the way she lived and persevered, that just became second nature to me because I saw an example of it every single day. And so fast forward to SEAL training, it was just like, all right, life is hard, but the way you beat a hard life is with hard work. That's how you beat it. That is, you, that's the only way to beat it. And so, um, yeah, going back wasn't, a, it wasn't like, ah, oh, this is going to suck. It's like, okay, it's time to go do it. It's going to suck, but time to go pay the man. <laughs> you know, it's time to go pay the man. That's it, man. That's what to it. So when you're doing it for the second time, obviously it would have broke majority of people, but did it make you then know what you were going to do to then enhance you for everything that you are going up against? Yeah, 100%. 100%. It, it definitely gave me an advantage because I knew everything that was coming. All the games that they were going to play, I already knew. So when we're in Hell Week and it's Thursday and they're like, or Wednesday, and they're like, you guys suck. We're going to make, we're going to keep this. Week. This is going to be the first class that Hell Week is going to last next for three days. I was just like, yeah, whatever. I heard that before, right? <laughs> so, uh, like, like yeah, I already knew what was coming, what was coming. I knew the, when the beatdowns were coming and how long. I kind of had an idea how long they would last. I had an idea how long surf tortures would last. And, you know, so it, it did give me an advantage, you know, for sure. What was the feeling when you passed? Everything you've done in your life from selling drugs to letting your mum down to letting yourself down, letting your dad down, like all that failure, failure, failure to then pushing through to the toughest training probably in the world that like is up there with SAS training, like to then accomplishing that and then is it graduating you do for the SEALs? What's it called? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have a big graduation ceremony. Yeah, um, so how was that feeling yeah, for you? It was, you know, it was, uh, it wasn't as, uh, gratifying as one would expect why to me it was just like now it's time to go to work because like i didn't go to seal training to graduate if that may if that makes sense i went to seal training to be a seal i think that that's where it can why a lot of people quit because you get people that they don't have that deep emotional reason why but they also don't they're not they don't they're looking at the wrong outcome. The wrong, the outright outcome is, okay, you make it through and now you're going to be a SEAL. A lot, it's not just about surviving to the end. And so, um, you know, similar to SAS Who Dares Wins, you know, for us, it's not about freaking surviving to the end. It's about coming to the course, facing your demons, and beginning the steps towards conquering your demons. So that you can go back into society, a changed person, and operate with the lessons that you've learned through the course. That's what our show, that's what the, 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 the SAS Computers Wins is about, right? And so that that was in similar similar fashion to me. It wasn't about graduating and getting to the end. It was about facing my demons, fighting, becoming a new person, and becoming a SEAL so I can go do the, do a job. So when I finally graduated, it was like, oh, I was like, all right. Let's go to work. Let's go. Let's go do the job. You know. So. So what happens once you graduate? What? Where do you go? Do you travel around the world? Do you stay in America? Like, yeah. So yeah. So when you so when I graduated in my case, you know, I got I got orders to a SEAL team. Um, went to a SEAL team um, on the West Coast. Um, you know, um, uh, worked on two different SEAL teams actually, and and you you start you do what's called a workup cycle. Um, where you do you train with your team. So the first part of the workup is where you you go to your specialization schools or whatever you're going to specialize in. So if you're a medic, then then if you you know you go to advanced medical courses. If you're a sniper, then 
or you want to be a sniper, then you go to sniper school, you go to advanced sniper school. Uh, and, then, and then after that, you come back, meet, meet up with your platoon, and then you do uh, 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 training as a platoon, and then you uh, do another block of training, and then you deploy. And that was my, that was my pattern. You know, 18 month, about an 18 month workup, six to seven month deployment, 18 month workup, six to seven month deployment, 18 month workup, six to seven month deployment. And, uh, you know, that was, you know, what I did. Most of my deployments were all to the Middle East. Um, I got to do some cool stuff, really, really cool stuff. And, uh, you know, got to do an augment with, uh, with a tier one unit. Um, and yeah, man, it was, it was, it was everything I, I dreamed of, man. It was to be able to really feel like you're making a difference in the world because you're, you know, you're operating the tip of the spear was, it was, and then coming from where I came from, you got to understand, man, I was, I was a drug dealer in the Bronx, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> to be a drug dealer in the Bronx and then now, and then be, you know, gearing up to get ready to go on an operation, go after HBT. I mean, that, that doesn't happen. And, uh, you know, another cool thing is I got to live the best of the both, best, best of both worlds because I was a human guy. So, you know, I told you earlier that each, every seal, uh, uh, has a specialization, sometimes multiple specializations. So I was a human guy, which stands for human intelligence. So I was able to go to a lot of intelligence schools and, and, you know, you know, learn a lot of cool things as it relates to trade craft and money sources and doing that stuff. So I got to do intelligence stuff overseas where, you know, in civilian clothes, beard grown out, having conversations with people and uh, doing surveillance, counter surveillance, and then building intelligence packages and then and passing that as intelligence packages up the chain of command and, and getting that information vetted and then getting kicked back down to us and getting the green light to go kick down a door and get a bad guy. So I got to live in the kind of like this spy world and then also kind of live in this in this operator world. And I'm a dude from the hood. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I'll never forget it. I will I never forget this. I'll never forget I was it was I was it was May of 2010. I was in a very hostile country. I won't name the country. And I remember being on this it was, it, I said, it was, sorry, it was May 5th, May 5th of 2010, because it was Cinco de Mayo. We have a holiday here called Cinco de Mayo, five, five. And uh, I'm at the CIA compound, poolside, with these CIA agents, and drinking Corona beers, and just looking at this beautiful pool. It used to be, you know, a bad, very well known bad guy's palace that was converted into a, uh, a, a CIA facility, and I just remember sitting at the pool drinking these Coronas. I'm just like, damn, how did I get here? Like, 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 it's like pinching myself. Like, this can't be real. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And uh, but man, I've, I've had a blessed life. I had a blessed career, man. And, uh, I enjoyed it. See the training you done twice. How 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 did that mentally keep you stable in hostile environments, especially if you were a spy trying to get intelligence, like to be so cool, calm and collective, like did your second stint of like hell week make you become who you were? No, I think that, well, I think, I think the ability to be able to be stable in hot situations and all that came from my upbringing. You know, there's, 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 uh, there's a saying, are SEALs, and I think this can go for SAS and SBS and uh, other special forces groups, are special forces operators born or made? Which means, are you born with everything that's needed to be a, to be an operator, or are you, you know, through life, are you nurtured into this operator? I think it's different for everybody. I think some people are born with specific SEALs, just like you get kids who are born with the gift of singing and they're going to be the best singer. People who are born with the gift of swimming. They just, their body is just designed to be, they got the born with long arms and long legs and a proper torso and everything to be, you know, Michael Phelps, right? Uh, I think it's a combination for, uh, I think some people, they're born with it. Some people, they, they, they learn it over time. They learn the skills that's acquired over time. Some people it's a combination. Um, whether it's 70, 30, whether it's 80, 20, whether it's, you know, uh, uh, 60, 40, I think it's a combination. 
for me, I think I was born with it, but then also I think that the way I grew up, you know, really gave me that mental toughness. My mom, like I said, my mom was a very strong willed person and she was a hard person on me and my brother. You know, how I got into writing, you know, started with my mother. She would make my brother and I read New York Times articles and write reports. And if our reports weren't near perfect, she would make us pick another article and write again. You know, my mother was all about do it right the first time. We would have to wash and dry the dishes every night. My brother and I, one, one night it'd be my turn to wash and my brother's turn to dry. And then the next night, you know, it'd be my turn to dry and my brother's turn to wash. And if those dishes weren't washed perfectly and dried perfectly, then she would take all of them out, put them in the sink, make us do it again. You know, my mom was a very, very, and still is, I mean, a very hardcore woman. You can see her on Instagram. People think she's my sister because she, she's this big fitness woman and she's 70 years old and she's running and doing all this crazy stuff that, you know, 30 year olds can't do. And she's always been like that though. And I say that to say, between my mother, the environment I grew up on, grew up in, especially, you know, walking the streets of the Bronx, being able to, having to be able to read people, having to be able to tell whether somebody's going to lie or somebody who's ready to fight you or whether it's a shootout is about to happen, and being able to, you know, read, you have to learn how to read people to survive in that environment. So between that and the mental toughness that I acquired from through DNA from my parents and then we had my mom kind of nurture through life, I feel like I, when I came to SEAL training, I was going to make it through SEAL training. I don't think SEAL training, I don't think it, SEAL t- training taught me anything more. I think what it did was it it showed me how to apply what was already there. And it showed me that I could apply what was already there. And so fast forward to now when it comes time to operate, all of that stuff, especially from the Bronx and the way, you know, that all came into play. I was, when I would go into meetings with sources, I could immediately tell when they were lying. It wasn't because of sewage training. It was because I grew up in the Bronx. You know, when I, I, I could immediately tell when somebody was had information that they wanted to give me. And it wasn't that they were lying. They were just terrified. And having to learn how to kind of massage that in a graceful way, massage that information out of them. So, so again, it was, it was, um, um, I, I don't credit a lot of it to SEAL training. Now, obviously, I had to go to specific schools. Like I said, I had to go to human school. So there was certain things that I that I learned, and there were certain things that I, you know, terms and things that, you know, maybe I had kind of learned in the streets that I was able to put tags on that I learned in the actual school programs. There were other things that, that I was able to learn that was able to, you know, further mold my skill set as a human operator and definitely as an operator, you know, shoot moving and communicating. But as far as the mental, we're talking just the mental toughness and fortitude and the ability to be able to have emotional intelligence and read people and read situations, that had always been there. How hard was it to get, gather intelligence in a war zone? It wasn't hard for me, man. I, it wasn't hard for me. And again, I think, you know, it's, it's hard. It's hard. Don't get me wrong. It's hard because it's not like... It, you have one conversation, everything works out. It's a process. It's a process. And I can't go into all the details because, you know, obviously sensitivity around the way we do what we do. Um, but the process wasn't hard for me. The outcome is always hard, but the process wasn't hard for me because I'm a very patient person. And, and, and because of, I've gone through processes, going through SEAL training twice, all these different things. And, you know, I'm, you know, it helped me uh, go through the process with risk. Was your life ever in danger? Of course it was. <laughs> <laughs> was there any scary yeah. moments for you that you thought that you may be oh, yeah. killed? Oh, yeah. Of course it was. Of course it was, man. Been shot at, you know what I mean? Like, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's war. When you go to war, I mean, it's war. You know, so yeah, I mean, I've been in a lot of hairy situations and, uh, and thank God I've survived a lot of all of them, you know, um, I've had a lot of friends who haven't, but you know, that didn't, but yeah, it's, it's, it's war, man. (laughs) Obviously you can, you can lose lives, you can lose brothers on the streets and you can lose them at war. How hard is that to lose someone you've spent a few years with and, Seeing them get their life took it well, how hard is that? Yeah, man, it's, it's rough, man. It's rough. I mean, this this 
picture I'm pointing to. I'm not sure if you. So this kind of frame thing. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. That's those are guys on my uh, on my team who uh, who died. You know. Um, you know, um, the pictures and the, and the write-ups of them. So I frame that and it goes, it goes bigger than what you see because my camera can't go, but those are all guys that, you know, I've lost, you know, and I keep a list of guys on my, uh, guys who I've served with, whether going through buds or whether served with in the teams, you know, uh, I keep a list, you know, of, of those guys on my computer as a reminder. You know of, uh, of 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 them and, and me and and the points of me continuing to fight in a different way and and, and serve. You know, yeah, I've had many many men on who's served in the army, the special forces, and we've became good yeah. friends. And I know they struggle with PTSD. Do you use how do you use what's the program like in America for guys who have served for their country? Is there a lot of help because there's there's help here, but not so much as there should be. Like, is there a lot of help for? men who serve in America? Yeah, I would say so. I would say so. Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, you know, when you serve, like one, you have, you get, you can get a VA loan for a house. So it makes buying a house easier. Um, I didn't pay for college. I didn't have to pay for my bachelor's degree. I didn't have to pay for my master's degree. As a matter of fact, when I was in school, uh, I got paid while I was in school, you know, from the government, you know? So, um, yeah, I mean, you got free schooling and you got, you know, uh, VA loans, all kinds of, and if you get a disability rating, then you get all kinds of other benefits. So I get like a, a, a mini retirement. Um, uh, you know, I get, you know, I get like my, my kids get to go to college for free because I served in the military. Um, I, I think the America really takes care of, our, of, of, of their troops. It's about to get up. There may be a law passed in the next few months. Um, where you, you don't have to pay property tax on your house, you have a disability rating. So, I mean, there's tons of benefits. I, I mean, I just got to, you know, I tore my labrum while I was in teams and I've been out of the military since 2016. So for, you know, uh, six years and I just got my, I got a PRP uh, procedure done on my shoulder, which is very expensive, thousands of dollars. Uh, a SEAL Foundation paid for, Navy SEAL Foundation paid for, excuse me, SEAL Future Foundation paid for. How long were you in the military for? 13 years, 13 and a half to be exact. <laughs> so that's a long time. So why the decision to leave? Have you got to hit a certain amount of years before you can leave? or what's Yeah, so my, you know, uh, for me, my, while my contract expired, was going to expire, you know, typically a lot of guys, especially after they get over the 10-year mark, they, they tend to stay in. Cause it's like, well, why not do the full 20 years and, and, uh, get a retirement. But, uh, you know, my first son was born in 2014. My second son was born in 2015. I, I wanted to be home. I wanted to watch them grow up and being a, a seal, being a seal, you're gone so much. And so I, I just wanted to, I wanted to be home. I wanted to be a family man. I wanted to live a normal life. And, uh, uh, you know, I was in grad school when I got out. So, you know, my plan when I got out, you know, I had a good savings, but then also, you know, I was, uh, I was going to go into business consulting. So that was the plan was to go into business consulting. And, uh, um, and that's why I was getting my master's degree. So, you know, I, I kind of had a plan, but it didn't work out quite as expected, but you know, that's kind of how everything happens for a reason. And, uh, you know, a few months after I got out, I got out in January, 2016 and then, um, in May of 2016 is when I got my start in Hollywood. Yeah, it's an amazing career you've had, which we'll touch on. The decision to leave the military, was that because obviously your dad wasn't there when you were a, when a kid, when you've got your own sons, you realised how important that is for the father to be around? Yeah, yeah, that was a big part of it. My dad died when I was five, as I mentioned, so I wanted to be around for my two sons, you know, it's now expanded. So now I have three sons and a daughter. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no wonder you work so hard now, brother. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah. when you leave the military, what was the steps then for your life then? I know you've got a bachelor's degree. You've been in Hollywood blockbusters. You've been in transformers. You've worked with Ryan Reynolds. Have you worked yeah. with Gerard Butler as well? Scotsman. Yeah, I did a movie with Gerard. Uh, it's going to come out in January. I did a movie with him uh, last last summer. That's it's going to call come, come out this January. It's called The Plane. Yeah, he's Scottish as well. How did how did you go on with the accent though? 
Oh, it's yeah. good. It's good. It's good. Yeah, I, I, I was, I'm, I'm good with accents. I'm good with being able to pick up what people are saying just because I've traveled so much. So, yeah, yeah, he definitely <laughs> has that Scottish accent. Yeah. So, how does a kid from the Bronx, like, life basically going nowhere to be either dead or going to prison to then becoming a Navy SEAL, passing two of the toughest courses on yeah. the planet to then being in Hollywood blockbusters? Like, how, did you do acting classes? No, no, no. So as I said, you know, I was in grad school when I got the phone call and uh, for business because I was going to go into business consulting. And this woman reached out to me and she said, hey, Michael Bay's looking for somebody of your background to be in the next Transformers film. Are you interested? And uh, hey, okay, you come to, can you come to set tomorrow? And uh, I was just like, yeah, I mean, I'm just writing papers. I think I could come, you know. And so uh, she said, all right, send me some pictures so I could show the base. I heard some pictures and then she was like, all right, you're approved. And uh, that one day on Transformers turned into three weeks, that three weeks turned into six months. And uh, that's essentially, and there's a lot more to the story, because, uh, but I won't get into it right now, but that's what started my career in Hollywood. And then from there, you know, I started consulting and acting on other commercials and and uh, and then, you know, I uh, at the same time, I'm still volunteering with different nonprofits, going to schools, going to prisons, working with human trafficking organizations. And uh, um, and I did a human trafficking trip. And I want to say summer of 2018 it was like July, mid at end of July, uh, beginning of August. And uh, I went down to uh, Dominican Republic and, and Haiti with Operation Underground Railroad, which is an uh, organization that employs former special operations guys, the CIA guys to rescue kids trapped in, in, in sex trafficking and organ harvesting. And uh, uh, when I was down there, uh, I, I was just, I mean, the stuff you see is just heartbreaking. And that's when I was just like, you know, I need to take my skill set as a filmmaker and somehow merge, merge this to fight you know, get in a fight against human trafficking. And interestingly, as soon as I my flight landed back in the States after that trip, I had all these messages from Michael Bay's uh, producing partner, um, uh, Mike Case, and he was just like, yeah, we've been looking for you. Michael Bay wants you to consult on a movie, uh, Six Underground. So that's how I, I, that's how I got back from that trip, and I immediately jumped into working on Six Underground with Netflix and Ryan Reynolds and, uh, and uh, Corey Hawkins and those actors, and uh, and then that's when I began again. Everything was a gradual process, and that's when I got into writing films as well, and and then started working on more films and TV shows, and then finally kind of you know gradually worked from being an actor consultant to being a writer to being a writer now writer director and, and and producer. So it was like it was a gradual thing. It didn't all happen at once. It didn't all happen from the standpoint of I want to be an actor at all. I was just thrown into it, and I was just like. I love storytelling and then it turned into, I love storytelling and I love being able to be able to have an impact on the world through storytelling, uh, specifically human trafficking. And uh, there's some other topics I want to cover as well at some point in my career. And and then it just grew from there. And now we are where we are today. I'm doing movies with Gerard Butler and, uh, uh, and other people. How did you work with Mark Wahlberg? Yeah, I worked with Mark Wahlberg on uh, Transformers. Great guy. Awesome man. Yeah, like that's that's a listers. That's phenomenal names. That, like, and you yeah. touched on the human trafficking. How bad is that in, on this planet at the moment? Oh, it's 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 horrific. Pull up a chair. It's horrific. It's uh, it's, as of now, it's a third. It's, it's projected as a thirty-two billion dollar um industry. Um, um, uh, it's it, the organ harvesting side of it, which is what I focus on and my film focuses on is. Is estimated at a one billion dollar industry. There's no real way to 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 know the statistics for sure as it relates to organ harvesting because it's so under the surface. But it's a massive, massive thing in the world. I mean, and then during the pandemic, I mean, you know, uh, online recruitment as it relates to human trafficking jumped twenty two percent during lockdowns, and then you know, twenty five percent. Uh, increase just on Facebook, ninety five percent increase on Instagram. I mean, it's a massive. Massive undertaking. Thirty thousand victims of just trafficking, not labor, not organ harvesting, uh, just sex trafficking, die from disease or torture every year. You know, uh, it's it's every and and then every year three hundred and um, excuse me every three hundred sixty five, but every year you know women and children account for uh, most of the six hundred to eight hundred thousand globally trafficked victims. 
it's something that it's it, it blows my mind how many people are not aware of this. Uh, it's an it's a it's an epidemic. It's a pandemic. It's a it's a it's it's just so widespread and it's happening all over the world. And uh, as I said, it's it's about to surpass the drug trade. Why do you think there's so little spoke about it on main, mainstream media, though? I think because it's such a horrible thing that people, and I could be wrong, but people think that if we don't talk about it, maybe it'll go away. Yeah. If I stick my head in the sand, maybe it'll go away. And, you know, it's not a topic that, I, I think that media is of the mindset that is not a topic that the general public wants to hear about. And I think that that's a travesty because when I talk about it or when I show films about it, people are just, they're, they're angry. They're more angry that they are have not been made aware of it than they are being made aware of it, knowing that these atrocities exist. There's more people enslaved around the world today than any other time in human history. Today. They are more slaves. And, you know, slavery has been around since the beginning of time. And there's more slaves today than any other time in human history. And again, that's, that's organ harvesting, that's sex trafficking, that's, that's, that's labor, that's people being used for testing, that's people being used to move drugs in. It's a, it's a, it's a massive thing. Yeah, the world's a fucked up place. There's so much beautiful things goes on in it as well, but a lot of people are not brainwashed towards it, but a lot of people are staying in a bubble where they work their nine to five job. They don't realise what actually goes on, the destruction, the pain, the misery, the deceit, like everything is controlled. And that's why it's some things are easier not to talk about because then because everybody people believe what they watch and read. So if you don't talk about it like you say, then it doesn't exist. Me and you even speaking about this, people will think those numbers can't be true. But it's fucking true. Like I've had um Ollie Ollerton on as well. He was in uh, celebrity SAS, he was special forces and they were in, I think, China and it was thousands of kids going missing weekly or monthly. Like the numbers were unbelievable, like the pain and destruction. Like it's like you say, it's such a big trade now. Like it's just fucking sad to think because I'm a father as well. I've got kids, so it's like you do everything to protect them and when you hear people talk about it, you don't realise the extent of actually what goes on and how how hard that is to try and protect people now, especially with social media as well. And so so many people can be brainwashed and conditioned into believing what they want. Like, how do do you think this problem's only going to get worse? Oh, it's only yeah. Especially now as we go into a global recession, it's going to get way worse. You know, and uh, uh, you know we and again, it's it's one of those things where it's it's this machine, it's this monster that. It's been around for a long period of time, but with technology, it's it's allowed it to be more vast. You know, it's allowed these organ harvesting and these human trafficking networks to work more fluidly, right? Because they can communicate, you know, for example, there's a story out of India um, with this uh, Nigerian um, uh, like computer engineer who created this website and he was able to essentially uh, create a, a, a kidney of uh, black market where poor Indians in India uh, would go on his website and they would essentially sell their sell one of their kidneys, you know, and for just to get a few hundred bucks, you know, that would be gone in less than a year. Right. And that all happened because of technology. As I mentioned earlier, during the pandemic, there was a, a 25 in, uh, uh, percent increase on, 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 on the web as it related to recruitment. You know, why is it growing? It was a 95% increase in recruitment on Instagram. So technology has allowed this thing to grow even more and even faster. Here in the United States, you know, the biggest problem of human trafficking is on the border. You know, and, and what has happened in the past, I interviewed a guy um, two, about three days ago who was trafficked from Venezuela to Colombia to uh, uh, to Mexico and it, it finally escaped. <laughs> he was enslaved, finally escaped and crossed into the United States, but naked. That's how he had to escape. And what he said was 
the uh, gangs and the cartel, what they're doing is they're sending, they're creating these fake travel agencies. And they're sending messages to coyotes all across South America. They're sending these digital ads as well, all across South America and other parts of the world to let people know, hey, America has an open border policy according to their politics, right? According to their politics, you know, uh, the current president said they're not turning anybody away. So these cartel and gang members have took, taken that soundbite and taken that information and created pamphlets and digital pamphlets to draw people to the border. So that's how this guy got caught up. He received a digital pamphlet saying, hey, this travel agency wants to help move you into the United States, they're best based in Mexico. So he traveled from Venezuela to Colombia, got to Mexico, this travel agency, I say that in air quotes, gave him a job on the border. After a few days, they, a car pulls up at gunpoint, orders him into the car. Uh, he gets into the car, they beat him up, stab him, and then they take him out, they drive him to a location, take him out of the car, open the trunk. There's three girls in the trunk who was also part of this travel agency you know, who, were, who were lured to Mexico through this travel agency. That car gets taken to a house in a very rich part of Mexico. Massive house. He gets, into, he gets put into the house with 100 people from all across, not just South America, but people from other parts of the world. They were all lured to this place the girls were used for sex trafficking. The kids were used as mules to move drugs into the United States because apparently the kids don't get vetted as, as harshly as the adults. And the men were used for labor or their families had to pay a ransom. And after the families paid the ransom, you know, these guys were executed because they were no use to the, to this gang anymore. And so, you know, it's 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 a problem everywhere and it's very, very real. And uh, as you said, I think, you know, people don't think it's real. But it, 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 but here's the interesting thing, too. You know, in, in working in, in the human trafficking space and doing all this research for my film and other projects that I work, have worked on, it's not hard to find information. There's articles and vetted news reports everywhere. I told you about that story in India. There's another story in India that's very well known news where this woman, she was in a um, very impoverished part of India and she received a, uh, a message online um, stating that she could uh, uh, get a job in New Delhi and because uh, there was no job opportunities where she was. And so she got excited, uh, you know, packed up her bags, got to New Delhi, um, the, 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 the job, I say that in air quotes, essentially her, her new boss, you know, uh, collected her at the, at the bus stop and gave her a, a small apartment for a few days. And one day, about three days in, he came to the apartment and said, Hey, you got to go get your medical checkup, uh, in order to start working. It's a new policy. She goes to this clinic in this kind of shady part of town and strips to get ready to do her uh, her uh, medical examination, she overhears through the door, somebody come in and says, yeah, she's going to be donating her organs. She's going to be giving this organ and this organ. Because of how it, her attentiveness saved her life, she got dressed, boogied out, reported, th reported this organ harvesting ring to the police, and it got exposed. And, and everybody, doctors, nurses, were arrested. And this was a multi-million dollar organ harvesting ring that had been going on for a number of years. They, I mean, there's a story that came out of Pakistan recently where police freed, you know, 20 people from an apartment, you know, and these people, again, were lured because, hey, come get this job. And they were right before that apartment got raided. The, the very next day, a few days later, these people were supposed to get their organs, their kidneys, their, their kidneys taken out and sold on the black market. You know, Cairo. Cairo is like the capital of the world as it relates to organ harvesting. You know, so this is something that goes on all around the world. There's another story as well that came. I'm sorry if I'm rambling on because all of these things are just coming to me, but I'm just trying to show the reality of it so that people can freaking wake up and stop digging their head in the sand and saying that's not real that's not happening that doesn't happen that's just a horror movie. there's a there's a very well-known story out of uh costa rica where um um this this israelis a group of israelis um 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 
Israelis broker these deals, but uh, there were uh, there was an Israeli broker who went to Costa Rica and and started this human organ harvesting thing with with this doctor in Costa Rica, where Israelis could fly in. They would pitch um, poor Costa Ricans to sell their kidneys. The poor Costa Rican Costa Ricans would sell a kidney for this Israeli and. Uh, uh, and, and for Israelis that were flying, they would get the surgery done in Costa Rica and get a new kidney, pay for it all on the black market. So, I mean, there's not a shortage of stories. Again, it's esti- there's no real way to, to, to estimate how much money organ harvesting makes because it's so under the surface and it's just happening all over. So it's really hard to pinpoint statistically, but it's estimated at, at least at a minimum. And I think that that number is very low. It's estimated at $1 billion a year. Yeah, it doesn't seem much because you see in the it sounds like a horror film, but I know places in Thailand and stuff like that. People used to just get drugged, took to an apartment, organs cut out and left in a nice bath. People are waking up with fucking hardly any organs. Like it's so extreme. Do you think it's just so easy for people to now be groomed online, where people want a better life, so they're groomed to then people saying they can give them a better job, money, house, apartment. And they're they're very naive towards that this stuff actually goes on. Yeah, it happens in three ways. And, you know, in in my research and the work that I've done in different human trafficking, I found that it happens in three ways. You have the willing, you have the person that's willing, right? You have the you have the victim who's like, I'm desperate. And this is well known in Egypt and specifically in Cairo, where you get people who are extremely desperate and they're trying to escape poverty. And, and 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 find buyers and or find a broker to sell a kidney. This is a, this is well documented. And so this is not something I'm pulling out of my ass. Okay. And so you have the the per, you have the people who are willing to give up an organ. Now let me give you a, a real world example that 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 I experienced when I was in Dominican Republic. I was in Dominican Republic operation or on operation the ground railroad. In uh, two, I want to say 2018, and we were in this slum in Dominican Republic. I mean, it was. I mean, I've been in a lot of poor places in the world, you know, especially doing my job. So I've seen a lot of crazy places where it's like, how do people live like this? But I was in this this place that was an absolute slum in Dominican Republic. I mean, the road that was meant for cars you couldn't drive a car on. It was just you could barely ride a freaking scooter motorcycle down. And the so the roads were now and they were these these I don't even know what to call them shacks along the road. And we're we're there and this guy, um, one of the locals pulls me into this chapel that had to be this no bigger than my my guest bathroom. And it's this family and there, about four or five people in there clamped in there, and at the at the end of the chapel was this casket. And it was a baby in there, it had to be about six months old. And what the guy told me was the baby died because this particular slum doesn't get clean water. And so the mother, you know, was she wasn't getting the proper nutrients to be able to breastfeed. So she so, so her milk dries. She said so she her milk dried up. And so she was using the dirty water with with formula. And that's how the baby died. And the reason why he showed me this was because. We know that this particular slum, that's why we were in this particular slum. We knew that this particular slum, in this particular slum, the parents would sell their children to traffickers in the north of DR. We were in the south of Dominican Republic. They would sell their children in the the north of uh, Dominican Republic. Why? Because that's where the Europeans and Americans and the Australians and the South Africans and all these different people would go to have sex with kids. Now, you would ask yourself, why in the hell would a parent do this? And, I, and I'm a parent of four kids. I got a daughter. I would never do that. But the reason why this particular guy that took me in the chapel was he was trying to sh- show me, give me a reason as to why a parent would do that. Because for these parents, it's like, well, if I don't do this with this kid, then I only have a, two kids die because they can't get proper water. They can't get proper food. I'm not trying to make it understandable because in my mind, it's, it, it'll never be understandable. But just, you know, kind of connecting that to, to the people in Cairo that sell their kidneys. They're so desperate that they're just like, I do anything to just have an opportunity. I do anything to just be able to get into America. 
I'll give up a kidney. I'll just, just tell me what you need and I'll give it up. And that's what we're seeing around the world is, you know, when people are desperate, they will do desperate things. And uh, like to, to, to us, we don't understand it, but it's, 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 it's similar to them not understanding how, how, how we can belittle or curse out or talk, talk, uh, talk badly of our political leaders or our presidents, right? Like to them, they just like in some of these countries, they're like, you get to talk bad about your president? Like, we don't understand how you could talk bad about the prime minister. Like that, you talk bad about your prime minister? You talk bad about this? Like that, they don't understand it because in their country, they get killed. <laughs> there is no freedom of speech in their country. So for them, it's hard to understand how we in, in you know, the UK and the US are able to have free speech and say anything we want to say, not just about political figures, but about other people uh, and people in power. They don't understand, they can't grasp that concept because they, they don't live here and in their country, they get killed, whereas we can't grasp the concept of a parent selling their child or a person selling their kidney in order to get a, a few thousand dollars. Yeah. Where's the you worst know? place in the world for human trafficking? Uh, well, I mean, America, well, it's really hard to pinpoint, but what we do know is that as it relates to human trafficking, America is the number one consumer of content, pornography specifically, uh, that involves traffic victims. So Americans drive the demand as it relates to material uh, that's been created with traffic victims. And that's just on the sex side. Um, um, now, this guy I was telling you about earlier, who I interviewed um, earlier this week, who was trafficked from Venezuela, eventually escaped into the United States. Um, he... Um, the, the biggest epiphany I got out of that interview was that because of how much disorder there is on the border, America's creating this massive collection point for traffic victims in Mexico. So Mexico has now become like a big trafficking hub as well, right? Cairo, as we know, historically has been a big freaking um, um, is, is, is known to be the uh, uh, the capital of the organ, of organ harvesting, um, uh, uh, organ trafficking, excuse me. Uh, but you also have India. India is, uh, in, uh, India is notorious for this. Uh, not just sex trafficking and organ harvesting, but also labor as it relates to that. And that's another thing. When, uh, when people hear of human trafficking, they automatically go to sex. You know, people, but it's, it's 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 more than just sex trafficking. It's organ harvesting. It's labor. It's 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 the uh, the male order brides from other countries that have been stolen from their home and now they're being sold on the dark web or the black web to wealthy people, wealthy men, or you know, in, in other countries. And now they're married to these guys and they were sold. So there's different facets of human trafficking. And uh, in and, and some countries, one facet may be more prevalent than another facet. For example, like I said, in, in, in Cairo and Egypt, the organ harvesting stuff, that's going to be more prevalent than, than probably in Thailand, where sex trafficking is a, a massive undertaking, just like it is in Cambodia and in, 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 in other parts of the world. So I don't think you could really pinpoint one country that is is, is is where that's where it's all happening and a majority of it is happening it's happening yeah. everywhere. it's heartbreaking even in there like they, they take the kids not just for sex but they cut their eyes out or cut their legs off so they can get more money when they're begging for money like that yeah. shit goes on and people think they only see it in films like it's, it's, real. it's more extreme than what people think yeah and when you think about it too you know as far as pricing wise you know a clean heart and lung or loan starts, like the fee, the price starts at $130,000. So it just starts there. That is, you know I mean, which means that it could go up probably to a million dollars, depending on how desperate a person is and how wealthy a person is. A liver or kidney is, goes for just under $100,000 and corneas of the eyes go for about $30,000. So if, if, if one human being, let's just conservatively say one human being can sell for anywhere between three hundred to five hundred thousand. I'm just being conservative. It's probably more than that, depending on as it relates to the black market trade of human organs. But if let's just say one human being, what could go for between three hundred to five hundred thousand dollars? How much 
time would it take for a trafficker to earn that money from a sex traffic victim? Yeah, that's pennies. It would take a it, long time. Yeah. Versus one day being able to earn upwards. And I'm, and I'm, I'm sure it could be, it's way more than 500,000. I'm just being conservative. So people don't say this guy's outlandish, but $500,000. And then on top of that, it's less risky for a trafficker. Why? Because when you have, when you're trafficking a girl for sex, you have johns that are coming, which means that they could pass on diseases and damage her, or they could beat her, or the john could be an undercover cop, or could be working for an NGO. You know, there's a there's a lot more risk they could, that this girl, if you have one human sex trafficking ring and another sex trafficking ring, and they could be these these battles because this trafficking ring has these girls on this block, and this trafficking ring has these girls on this block, and now it's this competition. Whereas they don't have to worry about the risk when you're just harvesting organs. You know, it's a very, very, it's a lot more money. It's very, very lucrative. It's, it's lucrative. And, you know, you think about kids go missing, people go missing all the time. And, uh, you know, and, and the sad thing is, and going back to the question you asked me earlier about, you know, why isn't media talking about this much? Is, I think it's in part because media doesn't realize they don't, they don't have a good understanding of the numbers, which nobody really does. You know, um, there was a case here in, in, in the United States and I'm sorry if I'm rambling on, but there's a state's here, a case here in, in, in Dallas at a Dallas Mavericks basketball game where a girl, she's at the basketball game with her father, playoff game, and she goes to the bathroom. She disappears, doesn't come back. You know, they looked at cameras, everything. What the cops said, it was like, she's a runaway. They wrote it off as she was a runaway. Okay. The parents were desperate. They, they you know, scoured the internet. They found the human trafficking because they, they just knew their daughter. They knew their daughter wasn't going to run away. They found a, a human trafficking nonprofit that was run by veterans. Those military guys, those veterans, you know, scarred, scoured the dark web. And about, you know, I think I came up with it was eight days or three weeks later, they found her. She was being trafficked on a dark web, drugged and trafficked. They set up a sting, rescued her, and arrested all of the people that were part of um, this sex trafficking ring. And guess what? They were at the game. They were looking for a soft target, right? But the police and authorities just wrote it off. Oh, she's just a runaway. How many people have just run away because they're teen? When in reality, they probably didn't. They were taken, you know? And so, um, yes, it's it's a massive thing. Yeah, that should be global news, that. Like, when you talk about drugs, somebody moving 10 kilos, 20 kilos... Like that money's nothing compared to people, 10 people being trafficked. That's five million pounds, basically. If you can get 500, 500 grand a body, some people maybe traffic 100 bodies. Kids in Africa, kids in Thailand, like India. Like it's easy to get people because like you say, there's parents selling their kids for $100, $1,000 to then those kids getting sold on for hundreds of thousands of pounds. Like... People are desperate. People sell their soul all the time, but you don't, you don't know the the street like America, UK. Like, it is a better living here. It's a high quality of living. But when you're in the slums, people will do anything for their kids to survive or for them to survive, and that's what we're trying to touch on. So how? So sorry, so sorry. There was three. There was three ways I said. There was one was the willing, uh, willing participant. Then you have the people who are tricked. You know, and this is a big thing that happens in Dubai. Uh, and, and I've done research and it's a lot with the labor, with the labor. So you, you, in Dubai, you have a lot of girls and men and also sex, labor and sex, who they're lured to Dubai for a better life. As soon as they land in Dubai, a lot of them from East Africa and, and other parts of the Middle East and India, as soon as they land in Dubai, their passports get taken by the traffickers. So they can't leave. They put in these shanty shacks and girls are used for sex. And uh, guys were used to labor. You know, a lot of uh, Dubai was built on the back of slaves. Okay. Now, with that said, um, that is the, so you got the willing participant, you have the person that's tricked, but then you also have this other piece to it where you have people that is just straight up taken. Kind of like the example with the guy who I shared, who I interviewed earlier this week, where he was taken and freaking, you know, trafficked, you know, taken, you know, against his will. And there's a lot of other stories. And then another thing which my film covers is the link to 
to, to trafficking as it relates to organ harvesting and terrorism. Uh, you know, a lot of terrorist groups, especially ISIS, you know, you know, when their when their um, financial lines were cut because of, of uh, interventions, I'll just kind of leave it at that. You know, they had to look at other ways to get money. And one of the ways they got money, especially in 2000 and 2016, 2017, was through tra- trafficking uh, Yazidis girls, you know, and trafficking girls in northern Iraq. And, and, and selling them for sex and selling them for organs and, and other, you know, and labor and other things. So uh, there is a link where, you know, uh, what we do, um, it can also, it, it, it's, an, it, it's a national security issue as well. You know, it's a national security issue. But again, those are the three different methods I yeah. wanted to. Yeah, fil- is this the film The Unexpected? Yeah, so my film, my film is called The Unexpected. That film is going to release September 30th, and that's based on true events uh, around a, uh, a a person. I don't want to give away too much, but a person who's trapped in the international organ harvesting ring. And I really went to painstaking uh, uh, details to ensure that it was as authentic as possible. Um, uh, whether interviewing people, whether firsthand knowledge from things that I saw, and uh, and and actual stories of actual people. So it's it's a very uh, authentic and, and, and realistic thing is based on true events and that one that's gonna release on YouTube on October or excuse me on September thirtieth. So that's gonna release on YouTube on September thirtieth. Yeah, so can you send me all the descriptions and all the links for people to then go and watch that? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, perfect yeah. brother. We'll touch on that. We'll get you back on again. We can touch on that more. Just before we finish up, we'll talk about your book, Transformed, as well. Where can people get that, brother? Uh, They can get that wherever books are sold, Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble. I'm not sure the name of the bookstores out there, but pretty much Amazon. Most of the people in the UK got my book. They've gotten it on Amazon. Uh, Amazon. Let's touch on, just before we go, uh, Celebrity SES. You're doing the UK show now, working with Fox and Mark Billingham, two good men. how's How's that show going for you? Yeah, that was awesome, man. That was awesome, man. That was a great experience. Billy and Fox, they're awesome dudes. Rudy's a great dude, too. Uh, Billy, I love those guys, man. They've become like brothers to me. And uh, yeah, man, I, I just had a great time working on the show. It just got announced, um, yeah, I want to say two days ago, maybe yesterday, I can't remember, but uh, that they're doing a U.S. version, which we already shot. So Foxy and Billy are in that as well, along with me, and that's going to air here in the U.S. on Fox. So that's going to be a big one. Yeah, unbelievable. I know a few of the contestants on it. I know Shannon Courtney, Callum Best in the UK one. Um, they're good people. Um, last question, brother, just for anybody that's maybe struggling or battling with mental health, what advice would you have for them? I would say attack the seed. I always say, I say, I would, you know, you know, we all have, I mean, I struggle with mental health stuff, that means, as all of us do, I think. Um I think every single person does struggle with some, whether it's self doubt, whether it's regret, whether it's uh, whether it's negative self talk. I can't do this. I won't do this. I'll suck. We all struggle with some level of it. And one, uh, a few pieces of advice that I try to give the, to people who have a struggle is, you know, especially when it comes to depression, is attack the seed. Whatever that negative thought is, deal with it counter that negative thought with positive self-talk counter that negative self-talk with positive self-talk so if you say to yourself today's going to suck and that just keeps a bar to you then beat that back with today's going to be a great day i'm still alive i got good health you know what i mean i still have a family like just and that and that's the biggest thing i always try to say attack attack the sea with positive yeah. self-talk yeah remy my brother listen for coming on today and telling your story i thoroughly enjoyed that very proud of you for everything you've achieved. No doubt your mum's very proud of you from the kid from the streets to your career's only basically just beginning as well with the new stuff that you've got coming up. Like It's amazing to see and a lot of people will get inspiration from your story. Would you like to finish up on anything, brother? No, I would just say, uh, you know, look out for the film September t- September 30th. Uh, I'm on, if you follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn, I'm dropping, you know, teaser um, uh, interviews from the actors, producers, and people behind the scenes and, and where they're sharing their, their, their experiences as it relates to human trafficking, their experience working on the film. And, uh, yeah, keep a lookout for that. That's going to be September 30th. Thank you, my brother, for coming on again. I appreciate it. God bless you. Good luck for the future, and I'll see you soon. God bless you. Thank you too, brother. Thanks, brother.